So uh, my name is Nathan Runkle. I'm the founder and executive director of Mercy Free Animals, and we are a national nonprofit animal protection organization. And our mission is to prevent cruelty to farmed animals and promote compassionate food choices and policies. So I wanna talk for a few minutes about how I got involved in animal protection issues. Uh, this is me uh, in St. Paris, Ohio, a town of about 2,000 people. I was born on a farm, come from a long uh, heritage of farmers, four generations. Uh, in this photo, my father is, I think, breaking all sorts of state and federal laws, potentially, child endangerment. <laughs> Uh, but growing up in this environment, I always had a natural affinity and connection for animals. I spent much of my childhood exploring the nearby creeks and streams and uh, looking at wildlife. And it was our dogs and cats that were the first to teach me that other creatures share our needs and our desires, that they have curiosities, senses of humor. And um, it wasn't something that I had to study in school. But from a young age, I witnessed the sort of uh, contradictory view that we hold for animals. I saw that our family cared very much about the dogs and cats that we had, but we did not have the same level of compassion or empathy or respect for other animals. So both of my uncles were hunters and trappers and fishermen. So from a young age, I witnessed animals being skinned while they were still alive having their heads ripped off when they were still alive. And most people in my social circle did not afford those animals much consideration. And that always felt wrong to me. I thought that we could and should do much better. There was a, a local animal abuse case uh, when I was 15, so in 1999, that is what ultimately led to me founding Mercy for Animals. And it was at a local high school, and there was a teacher there who had an agricultural class and this teacher also ran a pig farm. Now, one day he brought to school a bucket of day-old piglets to be used in a dissection project. Now, these were piglets that he had tried to kill that morning on his farm. But when he arrived to the school, one of the piglets was still alive. A student in the class who also did part-time work on the teacher's pig farm took the piglet by her hind legs and slammed her head first into the ground to try to kill this piglet. Now, the piglet didn't die. Uh, her skull was broken. She was bleeding out of her mouth. She's in horrible distress. A few of the students who are appalled by this act of abuse took the dying piglet, left the classroom, and took her to a, a teacher who is known as being a vegetarian and sympathetic to animal cruelty. That teacher left the school, went to a local vet office, and had the piglet euthanized. Now, following that case, there were two counts of animal cruelty that were filed, one against the student and one against the teacher. Now, the case generated a lot of media attention and controversy in this, this small farm community. And the pig farming community rallied behind the student and teacher. And they said, we don't want animal advocates coming into our town telling us how to do our jobs. The very first day of the trial, the cruelty charges were dismissed because it's considered standard agricultural practice to kill piglets by slamming them headfirst into the ground. And in Ohio, like at least 30 other states in this country, if something is considered standard agricultural practice, no matter how cruel it is, it's exempt from cruelty prosecution. So that case illustrated to me that there needed to be a voice for farmed animals in this community in Ohio. So since then, Mercy for Animals has grown to having over 100,000 members and supporters. We have five offices across the country, and we work to give a voice to farmed animals in four main areas, through public education campaigns, through undercover cruelty investigations, through corporate outreach and legal advocacy efforts. All right, so there you have it. Now, I want to start out by talking a bit about animals and our relationship to animals and why we should care. Now, Dr. Jane Goodall once said, we have to understand that we are not the only beings on this planet with personalities and minds. Now, as I'm sure many of you are aware, Dr. Goodall spent about 45 years in Africa living with and studying chimpanzees. She was one of the first researchers to give her subjects names as opposed to numbers. And she started to observe them and find out that many of the traits that we once held so closely as being unique to people were in fact not unique and are very widespread in the animal community. Things like culture and empathy and compassion. Things like 
not only using tools, but creating tools. So Dr. Goodall started to tear down these various boundaries. And I think looking at this image really illustrates it so perfectly. We know that other animals feel cold, the cold of this metal, the heat of the sun, that they form relationships in bonds, and that they too deserve our consideration. Now anyone who has shared their homes with dogs or cats knows this. We know how excited they are when we come home, how eager they are for their walks, how playful they are. Um, and this is, again, not something that we had to study animal behavior to know. And the scientific community is finally starting to catch up to what so many of us have known all along. Uh, just this year, the University of Cambridge uh, published the Cambridge Declaration of Consciousness. And essentially, this is the first time that an international group of prominent scientists supported the idea that animals are conscious and aware to the same degree that humans are. Now, this was really earth shattering for this to come out because they found that not only do mammals have consciousness and dogs and cats, but birds have the same level of consciousness. And not only birds, but fish, and not only fish, but octopus. So this whole notion, I think, should give all of us pause to really think about our treatment of animals and our obligation to them and how we can include them in our circle of consideration and ethics. So what we do at Mercy for Animals is help people step back and think about farm animals as individuals with needs and how we can respect them and do uh, due diligence in protecting their interests. So I want to talk a little bit about who farmed animals are first. Uh, this is an image of the, the wild ancestors of the modern day chicken. Now most people just think of chickens and you think of barnyards. And of course these birds once lived wild in the jungles of Southeast Asia. And they lived in a world that was very rich with sound and color, and they lived in social uh, groups of about a dozen birds, and uh, they were very active. Now, we've manipulated these animals uh, to becoming almost genetic Frankensteins of what they once were, and I'll talk about that a little bit later. But we see that even through hundreds or thousands of years of domestication, these animals still have the same behaviors, the same desires. These are egg-laying hens that live their entire lives in tiny cages. And this is a photograph of them about a month after they were rescued. And we see that these birds still want to perch, roost, dust bathe. They spend the nights in trees. Now, the more that we know about birds, the more respect we should have for them. We all know the term, the watchful mother hen. And this is a term that these birds really have earned. They will give their lives to protect their young. They have a very close bond with their, their young. They actually start to chirp and communicate with them while they're still in the eggs in the last few days before hatching. We know that birds can recognize 100 other birds based on their distinct facial features. I think if most of us saw a group of 100 chickens, we'd think that they all looked pretty similar. But to them, they look as unique and different as each of us do in this room to us. We know that they have a language that is unique to them. We know of at least 30 different calls that they have that are unique for overhead predators versus ground predators. They have a more intimate tone and inflection that they use with birds that they consider to be their friends. We know that chickens understand that recently hidden objects still exist. They're not rocket science, but this is beyond the ability of small human children. That has led Dr. Donald, uh, Bernard Rowland to state, contrary to what one may hear from the industry, chickens are complex behaviorally, do quite well in learning, show a rich social organization, and have a diverse repertoire of calls. Anyone who has kept barnyard chickens recognizes their distinct differences in personality. And of course, anyone who has spent any time with chickens knows that there are some who uh, like the attention of people who will follow you around and peck at your toes, wanting treats, and others who would prefer to be on their own. Now, the scientific community is starting to catch up to this notion. Uh, this is an illustration that appeared in the Washington Post in 2005, where the scientific community called for a remapping of the bird brain, saying that about 90% of the over 2,000 terms that we use in referring to the structure of a bird brain is outdated and it needs to be reevaluated. So what we see on the right-hand side of this illustration is the, tr the 
the traditional view of a bird's brain. And we see that most of it we thought was just used for instinctive behaviors, that birds were going around and just acting by instinct, with a very small amount being used for cognitive behavior or learning. But our new view, which we see in the middle here, is that over 75% of the bird's brain is used for complex cognitive behavior or learning. Now, pigs are also intelligent, sensitive creatures. Some people say that they're the fourth most intelligent creatures on the face of the planet. We know that these animals have strong bonds that they also form with their young. We know that they have a unique language. We know of at least 20 different grunts or oinks that they make that mean very distinct things. And we know that they have long-term memories. There's a study done at Penn State University. They took a group of pigs and they presented them with three objects. One was a dumbbell, one was a frisbee, and one was a ball. And they taught the pigs to pick up the frisbee, to sit next to the dumbbell, and to jump over the ball. Now they took those pigs away for three years without ever seeing those objects. Three years later, they brought them back, presented them with the objects, and 100% of the pigs, without any retraining or prompting, remembered those behaviors that they were taught three years before. Now, Dr. Donald Broom said pigs have the cognitive ability to be sophisticated, even more so than dogs and certainly three-year-olds. He's talking about three-year-old humans. Anyone who has children or nieces or nephews knows just how intelligent three-year-olds are, how they have a sense of humor and curiosity. To think that that same level of thinking is going on in the mind of a pig should give us all pause to how we treat them. Now, uh, researchers have taught pigs how to play video games using remote-controlled joysticks showing that they understand cause and effect. Now, I have mixed feelings about bringing an entire another species into the video game revolution. I think it's causing problems for our own species, but nevertheless, there it is. And then, of course, we have cows. I think some of the most benevolent, peaceful creatures uh, on the planet. These are animals that, again, form strong bonds with their young. We hear story after story of mother cows who've been separated from their young not only bellowing out in distress for days on end, but jumping over fences and traveling miles on end to be relocated with their young. We know that cows have best friends that they spend most of their time with and that they show excitement when they solve problems. And finally, I wanna talk for just a second about fish. Now, most people don't give much thought to fish and it's easy to really disregard them because they inhabit a world that is so different from us underwater they don't have the same ability to express their feelings through facial features. They can't scream. But fish are not swimming vegetables. And we know that these animals suffer pain and fear and distress in much the same way that we do. They did a study where they took fish and they injected bee venom under their scales. And what they found is that the fish's heart rate elevated that they started swimming frantically back and forth in the enclosure and rubbing that area of their body against the enclosure. Their brains also release natural painkillers, and they release oxytocin, or natural feel-good drug. Uh, this is an illustration of the structure of a, bird br uh, of a fish brain versus a human brain. What we see is that though they may be structured differently, they still have the same functions. So here we say that on the surface of the fish's in brain, there are structures that serve functions similar to the limbic system of mammals. In mammals, these cerebral receptors are responsible, among other things, for the emotional evaluation of information, and they play a role in creating memories and in learning processes. And we know, too, that fish can use tools, that some of them form lifelong monogamous relationships with other fish. And I say all this because I think we've become so disconnected from these animals. Few of us will ever spend much time with a cow or a pig or a chicken. Um, so it's good to know this, but I really don't think it matters all that much if these animals can solve mathematical equations because these are arbitrary tests that we've created for other animals uh, based on our own uh, intelligence. Jeremy Bentham said, the question is not can they reason nor can they talk, but can they suffer? And I think that we are at a time where there's really no legitimate debate now whether animals can suffer. They have brains, central nervous systems, nerve endings. Pain to them is used in the same way as it is for us, as a way to move away from negative stimuli to protect them. So 
I think the test that we have as ethical, conscious, moral creatures is how can we live on this planet and do the most good and the least harm? And knowing that farm animals suffer pain, how can we, in good conscience, ignore their plight? So what is the plight for these animals? Well, about 60, 70, 80 years ago, most farm animals lived relatively decent lives, outside in small flocks, and uh, this is an illustration showing that. Many of them were even slaughtered on the farm. But unfortunately, much has changed. In fact, so few people are involved in agriculture now, less than 2%, that they're removing it from the Census Bureau occupational section. So with this change in the amount of meat that people are con consuming in this country, has become, ha we've seen a huge increase in the number of animals being killed for food. Now over 8 billion, with a B, farmed animals are killed every year in this country. This is a, a graph showing the slaughter rate of animals. Nearly 300 chickens are killed every single second in this country. Over three pigs killed every second and a cow every single second. Now these numbers, none of us can really grasp. As the saying goes, one death is a tragedy, but a million deaths, or in this case, eight billion, is just a statistic. It's really difficult for us to relate to these numbers. They're so mind-boggling. But it's one, and then one, and then one, all the way up to eight billion. So gone are the days of the idyllic barnyard scenes that we grew up with in movies and in our children's books. And this is what a modern day farm looks like. This is a factory egg farm. And on this small piece of property, you can find millions of animals intensively confined. This is what most people know about our current agricultural system, nothing. They're kept completely in the dark on how these animals are treated. And that's because the meat, dairy, and egg industries spend millions and millions of dollars every year spoon feeding us ads about happy cows and happy chickens to mask the reality of this institutional uh, and industrialized farming system. So what we aim to do at Mercy for Animals with our undercover investigations is to pull back the curtains of these facilities and to shine a bright spotlight on these animals' plights. So now in industrial farming, we see that animals are being treated as commodities, resources, machines, and production units. This is a quote that appeared in National Hog Farmer magazine that said, the breeding sow should be thought of and treated as a valuable piece of machinery whose function is to pump out baby pigs like a sausage machine. And we see that these intelligent, sensitive creatures have been reduced to just that, machines. They live their lives in tiny crates where they can't even turn around or lie down comfortably for nearly their entire lives. They resort to bar biting, banging the head, their heads against the, the wire and, and, and steel structures of their cages because they've literally gone insane. We've created genetic Frankensteins of chickens. On the right here, we have the modern broiler chicken named literally after the cooking method. These are meat type birds. On the left, we have the modern day egg laying chicken. So what we've done is we've taken these meat type birds and we've, we've bred them to grow so large so fast that many of them can't even withstand their own body weight on their legs. Now, back in the 1950s, it took almost 70 days for a chicken to reach market weight. Today, it takes about 47, in some cases, 35. They're continuing to chip time off of these animals' lives and they're reaching a much larger weight. So we essentially have our baby animals in obese adult bodies. And what we see is that they suffer from leg disorders, heart and lung failures, and they're in chronic pain. Now a study found that 90% of these broiler chickens will eat feed that's laced with painkillers to self-medicate themselves. They're in such chronic pain. And the same is true for turkeys. This is a photograph taken at a butterball facility in North Carolina, and this is uh, where the tom turkeys, or the male turkeys, are used for breeding. Some of these turkeys reach 90 pounds. They can hardly walk by the time that they're slaughtered. Now, egg-laying chickens have bred to be smaller birds, but to produce an unnaturally high amount of eggs. Now, before we domesticated these animals, they laid about 24 eggs a year. In the 1950s, they would lay about 120 eggs a year, Today, they lay over 200 
eggs per year. This takes an extreme toll on their bodies. Their calcium is being used to produce the eggs, so they suffer from broken bones and osteoporosis. And this is how 95% of the hens in this country are confined. They're kept in cages the size of a file drawer cabinet with anywhere from five to seven birds. They can't even spread their wings. They can't walk, perch, roost, dust bathe. They can't do anything that comes natural to them. And then we have cows that are used for milk production. These animals are artificially inseminated time and time again because cows, like all other mammals, have to give birth in order to lactate. So what happens to these baby cows? They're taken away. Many of them go into the veal industry. The mothers live like this for about five years, and then they're slaughtered. I think this ad poses the question uh, rather bluntly, do we need to be drinking cow's milk at all? You know, we, know, we hear the term that, that, that milk is nature's perfect food. And cow's milk is nature's perfect food if you're a baby calf who's doubling in size every few weeks. But when we think about it, we're the only species to drink milk past infancy. We're the only species to drink the milk of another species. And this has led to a system of just absolute horror and cruelty for these animals. Now, Ruth Harrison, in her book Animal Machines, said, if one person is unkind to an animal, it's considered to be cruelty. But where a lot of people are unkind to animals, especially in the name of commerce, the cruelty is condoned, and once sums of money are at stake, we defended to the last by otherwise intelligent people. And I think that this really puts into perspective our current view and treatment of animals in this country. Polls have been done by Zogby and Gallup, Ohio State University, uh, universities across the country that find that Americans oppose animal abuse. 93% of Americans say animals deserve protection from cruelty, neglect, and abuse. 93%. I challenge you to find any other issue in this country where you can get 93% of people to agree. But when it comes to animals, we stand united in that belief. But, that's not, but that belief does not reflect our actual treatment of the majority of animals. So I'm going to show a short four minute video and it shows what happens on factory farms and slaughterhouses. Some of you may find it a bit disturbing, but I think to be ethical consumers, it really is our obligation to take a look at these systems. In the next few minutes, you will be given an eye-opening look behind the closed doors of modern farms, hatcheries, and slaughter plants, revealing the journey that animals make from farm to fridge. Crowded by the thousands into filthy sheds, chickens and turkeys are denied many of their most basic natural behaviors and needs, such as fresh air and exercise. Sick or injured birds often have their necks broken. Others are clubbed to death. At the slaughter plant, the birds are dumped from their crates, then roughly snapped upside down into moving shackles by their fragile legs. From there, the birds are dragged through an electrified vat of water, which renders them paralyzed, but not necessarily unconscious. They are then pulled across a blade, which slices their throats, causing blood to pour from their necks. The egg industry subjects chicks to horrors few of us can even imagine. Because male chicks don't lay eggs and do not grow quickly enough to be raised profitably for meat, they are killed within hours after hatching. Male chicks are typically thrown into giant grinding machines while still alive. Another killing method is to drop male chicks into trash bags to be smothered or suffocated. The females have it even worse, destined for a life of prolonged cruelty. To reduce pecking induced by overcrowded living conditions, workers use a hot blade or laser to remove part of the chick's beaks. This mutilation can cause both acute and chronic pain. After debeaking, the birds are moved to cages where they will spend the rest of their lives. Nearly 95% of egg-laying hens spend their lives confined in tiny wire cages like this. The majority of today's dairy cows are confined on factory farms. Workers subject young cows to painful mutilations and amputations. Here, a worker cuts off a cow's tail, slicing through her sensitive skin, nerves and bone without any painkillers. Injuries and illness often run rampant in filthy, disease-ridden factory farm environments. 
Cows too sick or injured to stand are called downers and are often left to slowly suffer and die from their injuries. Calves on dairy farms are dragged away from their mothers and violently killed, all so that humans can have the milk instead. At a fraction of their natural lifespan, the so-called spent dairy cows are prodded onto transport trucks and shipped to slaughterhouses. Unreliable, stunning practices at the slaughterhouse condemn many cattle to having their throats cut and their limbs hacked off while still alive and conscious. For nearly their entire four-month pregnancies, mother sows are locked in narrow metal stalls barely larger than their own bodies. Soon after birth, piglets are castrated by workers who cut into their skin and rip out their testicles. Next, the workers chop off their tails. Both of these painful procedures are nearly always done without anesthesia. The piglets who become sick or injured or who are not growing quickly enough are killed. Common killing methods include being slammed head first into the ground. Once pigs have reached market weight, they are sent to slaughter. At the slaughterhouse, pigs are knocked in the head with a steel rod, hung upside down, and have their throats slit. Improper stunning condemns many pigs to having their throats slit while they are fully conscious and suffering. If you are at all moved by this film, please do your part. Make a commitment today to explore a vegan diet. For delicious vegan recipes, nutritional information, and tips on making the transition to a plant-based diet, please visit chooseveg.com. Now, in his book, uh, Eating Animals, Jonathan Safran Foer spoke to a number of factory farmers about these issues, and many of them wanted to remain anonymous. This is a quote from one of them. What I hate is when consumers act as if farmers want these things. And it's consumers who tell farmers what to grow. They have wanted cheap food, we've grown it. And I think when a lot of people see this, this video, uh, they're, they're angry. And a lot of times they direct that anger towards the individual employees in these facilities. Instead of stepping back and looking at the system in a broader, larger view. What we have found is that in many of these factory farm and slaughterhouse environments, the workers are victims of this system in much the same way as the animals are. Uh, many of them are undocumented workers. They take this work because it's the only work they can find. They work long hours, and what we see is that many of them are very troubled initially by what they see there. And in fact, there have been studies done that find that many slaughterhouse and factory farm workers suffer from what's called per perpetration-induced traumatic stress disorder, which is essentially a form of post-traumatic stress disorder that comes about when people are put in situations to do things that they find morally um, unacceptable. We saw this in some situations with Nazis and executioners, people that are in war environments. We're seeing the same thing in factory farm workers and slaughterhouse workers. And as a result, we see increased levels of alcohol and drug abuse. We see increased numbers of domestic violence disputes. So I think we have to ask ourselves, if this system is so unpleasant and violent and cruel that it causes psychological distress and damage to the people that have to work in them, what does that say about the practice? And is that something that we should be supporting in a civilized society? The other thing that people say is, this footage must be old, this must be out of the United States, this couldn't possibly be happening in the 21st century. We have laws and regulations for everything, right? Well, unfortunately, pretty much all of this footage that you saw was taken in the last five years alone in the United States. This is just a snapshot of the treatment these animals endure. So what, is, what do the laws look like in this country? Well, unfortunately, they don't look very promising for farmed animals. We have a system where agribusiness is so large and powerful that they've been able to lobby so that state and federal laws are written in a way that exempt farmed animals. So on a federal level, we see that there's not a single federal law that provides protection to farmed animals during their lives on factory farms. There is a federal law for transport and slaughter for mammals, but it totally exempts birds, which make up over 95% of the animals used for food production. 
So for the majority of these animals' lives, no protection on the federal level. The Humane Methods of Slaughter Act exempt birds, which means that many of them have their throats slit and go into the scalding tanks while they're still alive. Now, all 50 states have anti-cruelty laws, varying in scope and definition. But most of them completely exempt or largely exempt farm animals from their protection. So similar to the case that I described earlier about the piglet being slammed into the ground, we see that other routine practices that cause extreme suffering for animals are allowed to happen on a state level as well. Things like inflicting third degree burns on animals that are conscious without painkillers is deemed legal because of exemptions. Castrating piglets, legal without painkillers because of exemptions. Now, to put this into context, if you had a puppy that you took to your local vet and said, I'm here to have my puppy neutered, and your vet took your puppy by his hind legs, held him up, took out a scalpel, cut him open, ripped out his testicles, and hand the puppy back to you, you probably wouldn't be very thrilled or excited with your vet visit, and you'd probably call law enforcement, and that vet would probably be shut down for malpractice and charged with animal cruelty. But we do this to piglets every single day, and these aren't even vets that are doing this. These are untrained, unskilled workers working at an alarming rate. And then we have things like cutting the beaks off of chickens without any painkillers also allowed to happen. So we've handed the power to decide what is cruelty and what is acceptable to the very industries that profit off of using these animals themselves, and that hasn't worked. Now the good news is that we're starting to see some change on this issue as consumers wake up to these practices. In 2008, California passed Proposition 2, and Proposition 2 was a modest yet meaningful initiative that said that, that uh, calves raised for veal, pregnant pigs, and egg-laying hens had to be given enough space to stand up, turn around, lie down, and extend their limbs. Now that ballot initiative passed by an overwhelming majority. 63% of California voters passed Proposition 2. More people voted for Prop 2 in 2008 than voted for Obama in California. And this law really helped set a precedent. And since then, we've had nine states pass laws banning these tiny gestation crates for breeding pigs. A number of states banning battery cages for egg-laying hens and veal crates also being outlawed. But there's still much work to be done. I want to sh tell you a quick story about this man here. His name is Virgil Butler. Virgil Butler worked for almost 10 years in a Tyson slaughterhouse in Arkansas. And Virgil's job was to take birds as they arrived in crates and snap them into those moving conveyor belts that you just saw. Now, Virgil witnessed a lot of abuse, not only the standard mistreatment of these animals, but he, he witnessed his coworkers stomping on birds, ripping their heads off, putting ice bombs in them, and watching them explode on the slaughter line. And over time, Virgil started to become very disturbed by what he saw. He started having nightmares. And he said, I can't be involved in this system any longer. So Virgil quit his job. He had no real financial backing. This is his trailer that he lived in behind him in this photograph. And he went vegan, and he became an animal rights activist. And he started blogging about what he saw, not only to expose the abuse, but his self-therapy as well. And he started traveling the country sharing his, ex his first-hand experiences with others. So I think that Virgil is one of many examples of someone who can be so invested and involved in this system, but can still be in touch with that greater good that he has, that spark of humanity, and he has made changes. And I think that if Virgil can do this, any of us, no matter where we are in our current lives, can make changes, can take steps to become more compassionate. Now we live in, a, in an era where our forks and knives have become really weapons of mass destruction. We can use them for compassion and kindness for animals or cruelty and exploitation. Now I think if these were eight billion dogs or cats that were being subjected to these conditions, there would be such a public outcry. And we should have that same level of outcry for farmed animals as well. Now, the economist put it well, I think, when they said few people would keep a hen in a shoebox for her entire egg-laying life, but practically everyone will eat smartly packaged farm-fresh eggs from battery hens. Few of us in good conscience would treat these animals in the way that you've seen this afternoon, but when we go to the supermarket and we buy these products, 
we're essentially hiring someone to do this dirty work on our behalf. So we have to ask ourselves, do we feel comfortable supporting this abuse financially? Because that's what we're doing is we're financing it. Now our food choices have a huge impact. The average American eats about 2,700 land animals in their lifetime. So by making some dietary changes, by eliminating meat on Mondays, or reducing our meat consumption, becoming a flexitarian, or becoming a full-blown vegan, we can help spare animals this suffering. And this is an illustration showing those number of animals. And we really are at a critical juncture. We're at a time when not only is animal abuse rampant in this industry, but the environmental impact of animal agriculture is very extreme and severe. The United Nations published a report, Livestock's Long Shadow, that found that animal agriculture is responsible for the release of more greenhouse gases than the entire transportation sector combined. 18% of greenhouse gases are associated with the livestock sector. So more so than cars, trains, automobiles uh, combined. So not only are we wreaking havoc on animals in the environment, but also to our own health as well. And that's what's led the UN to say that we should be eating less meat to curb global warming. And we see that it's not just global warming, but it's a waste of resources. We have to use so much water, which is a scarce commodity and growing scarcer now across the globe. We see that we're funneling so much grain into animals to get a relatively small amount of meat in return. Now, this is an article that appeared uh, all over the country recently, but this particular screenshot is from Drover's Cattle Network. It's America's uh, best business source for beef producers. This is on the homepage of their website. It says, we'll all be vegetarian by 2050, scientists say. And this is not because everyone chooses to be vegetarian by 2050, but because we simply will not be able to sustain meat production for a growing population by then. So we're at a juncture where we can either choose to be innovative in solving this issue, or we can be dragged there by necessity, by the collapse of our environment and ecosystems and animal cruelty just being out of control. Now, thankfully, there are some real pioneers that are jumping on the plant-based diet bandwagon. We have Biz Stone, I'm sure all of you have heard of before, um, who is a proud vegan, an ethical vegan. We have Russell Simmons, uh, founder of Def Jam Records, who has adopted a plant-based diet. Uh, former President Bill Clinton, who is an outspoken advocate for plant-based eating. And then we have billionaire uh, Steve Wynn from uh, Las Vegas, who is also jumping on the veggie bandwagon. It's not just some of the brightest minds and entrepreneurs, but we have sports athletes, the Houston Texan Arian Foster, who is a, a proud vegan now as well, showing that we sacrifice nothing, not our strength, not our health, by eliminating meat. We gain everything. And we're starting to see the, the new generation of college students embracing this idea and the need as well. A recent study found that in the last three years, the number of vegans on college campuses has doubled. The number of vegetarians increased by 50%. And there are now all vegan dining halls in this country, including one right here in Texas at Denton University. And this is an image of the Denton uh, vegan dining hall. Now, Washington Post did a survey that said, what will future generations condemn us for? And they found that second only to our treatment of the environment is our treatment of animals in food production. So I think that this is a generational issue, like so many social issues are. And this is one of our time. We have billions of animals that are being subjected to horrors beyond belief. And I think that future generations will ask us, what did we do to right this wrong? I think that animal protection is a social justice movement based on the number of individuals that are suffering and the degree of their suffering. I think it's one of the most pressing of our time. Unlike other social justice movements where those that are being oppressed had a voice in society to some degree, they could protest, they could lobby, they could ask for boycotts, these animals can't do that. Now you saw in this video of factory farms and slaughterhouses that these animals kick and scream, they struggle and fight against their oppressors to the best of their ability. But they do rely on each and every one of us to speak out on their behalf within our society and culture. We are in a situation where we hold all of the power. 
and these animals are completely at our mercy. Now, what we do with that power is totally up to us, and with power comes responsibility. And as Harriet Beecher so said, it's a matter of taking the side of the weak against the strong, something the best people have always done. And I think it's hard to imagine a group of individuals that are weaker and more vulnerable than farmed animals. So I encourage you to take the side of the weak against the strong and make decisions and take actions that will help bring compassion and justice to them. Thank you so much. I think we have time for some questions, if anyone has any. Yeah, uh, so Europe, I would say, is about 10 years ahead of the US in terms of addressing farm animal protection issues. They, um, in some cases, about 10 years ago, started banning veal crates, battery cages, just, just, just excuse me, gestation crates. Um, and some of those are now taking effect, some of them last year, some of them next year. So yes, they're starting to uh, address those issues. Now we have other countries, unfortunately, more developing uh, countries like India that for the longest time sort of held as its root belief that animals deserved uh, compassion. Now we're seeing factory farm interests, McDonald's, Burger King, Wendy's coming into these countries and meat consumption is dramatically rising. And with that, we see factory farming coming into those countries. So for example, in India, there's as many hens and battery cages in India as there are in the United States now. So we see some countries that are leading the way and ahead of us, and then we have others that are actually just sort of catching up with factory farming. So it's, it's an issue that, that needs to be addressed globally. Yeah, um, I don't know all the specifics of their, their economics there, uh, but you know, one issue is, you can look at grids and you can see just how meat consumption has dramatically increased in the United States. Now the good news is since 2007, meat consumption in the US has started to decline. Really for the first time, we're now killing about 400 million fewer farm animals than we were in, in 2007. It's about a 12% decline. Um, in, in Latin America, you know, my guess would be that they're probably eating more uh, cows than they are chickens, and those are animals that you, know, you can have out in a grazing area more, which, which cost less than these intensive factory farm systems would. It's a great question. Um, you know, sort of like the quote from the anonymous factory farmer, it's not that you know, farmers are run by a bunch of sadistic people. These are people that respond to the marketplace and supply and demand. Um, so we see the, the plant-based food market just dramatically expo exploding as people become um, more aware of it. Bill Gates, actually, this is not a joke, um, <laughs> recently said that really the, the future of food is in plant-based uh, proteins and, and things. Again, looking at the environmental impact, the cruelty issues. So I think we're gonna see more of that grow. In terms of these cage-free, free-range, uh, you know, so-called humane meat products, it's a business decision, but you know, ultimately I think it's a business decision that is helping animals to some extent. You know, they're getting them out of the, these really intensive confinement systems. But I don't think that the typical cage-free or free-range egg facility looks like what most people think it should look like. Because um, you're absolutely right, they're the same big you know, interest, the big factory farms that are producing these eggs. And we've done investigations at these places. They'll have one shed on the same property that are battery cages, and the next shed will be the cage-free eggs. And they'll have ten, literally tens of thousands of birds in windowless sheds. Um, they're not in cages, which is an improvement. Some of them have perches. They can walk around. But they're not frolicking out in the field like most people would imagine. So I think it's... I think it's, it's progress, but it's certainly not perfection. And I think overall we need to at least be decreasing the amount of animal products that we're using. It's about efficiency, you know? It's, it, these are you know, factory farms, they're the model of efficiency. And if they can it, um, mechanize everything and have animals in a smaller area, it takes less labor to get the job done takes less you know, heating and electricity to, to, to um, operate those units. So it's, it's all about efficiency. I mean, certainly there is, there is land available to give these animals. You know, 
I don't think that the world or life is ever in black and white terms, and we understand that. Now, we certainly think that a vegan diet is, in most situations, the most ethical, compassionate, environmentally friendly choice that we can make. So, of course, we hold that as the gold standard. But we understand that there are gradations along the line of agriculture. We have intensive factory farm systems, which, which is unfortunately how the vast majority of food is produced. It's, like I said, 95% of egg laying hens. We've got pretty much all the broiler chickens. About 80% of pigs are intensively confined. You know, this is the gold standard. These, these other situations are such really the mon monopoly that you have to go out of your way to find. Um, so we think people need to know what the choices are, but is a cow that's lived out her entire life in pasture and then was killed on the farm better than a factory farm? Absolutely, it's better. Um, do I think that we should be killing the cow rather than eating the carrots? Probably the carrots is a better choice for me, you know, ethically. If I don't have to take a life and be violent, probably wouldn't. But there are people that just don't share that belief. And I think for them, doing, again, as little harm and as much good as possible is really what we should be looking at. And certainly, whether you're a diehard meat eater or a, my, a diehard meat eater or a vegan, we can all probably agree that this factory farm system just doesn't fall into line with what is ethical for us. Yeah, um, it's true. A lot of these animals still go to the same slaughterhouse. Some of them are killed on the farm, but again, that's such a small percentage. So yes, a lot of them go to the same slaughterhouses. For egg laying hens, most of the, the chicks still come from the same hatchery. So all the male chicks are still ground up alive. They still have their beaks cut off. Um, so there are, there are built in, I think, moral uh, issues that we have to look at with, with animal agriculture to begin with, you know? And those are things that we have to sort of come to terms with what we're comfortable with. Um, th there, is, there is an amount of, of domination and, and exploitation that's involved in any agricultural system, of course. Um, so you're, you're absolutely right. I think it does boil down to, are we okay with some amount of violence to animals for food, or do we just want to remove ourselves completely from that system? I've chosen to remove myself from that system. But to say that all farms are exactly the same, I think probably oversimplifies the issue a bit. But those are things that we should all just be aware of as conscious consumers, yeah. Yeah, um, it's a great question. And, you know, part, a big part of why meat, dairy, and egg products are so cheap is because they're subsidized by the government. Um, if we were actually paying the true cost, those products would be much higher. Um, so I think that's a whole issue that needs to, we really need to take a critical look at. Um, but there are, uh, there's obviously a vegan diet that can be very expensive, that you're eating a lot of niche you know, meat alternative products that are made. And then you can have one that is, you know, based more on uh, beans and nuts and leg legumes and vegetables and things that can in some situations actually be cheaper to eat that way. Um, but in terms of sort of addressing this, there are a number of companies now, one is Beyond Meat, that is looking to make meat alternative products that are cheaper than meat products are. Uh, they have no fat, no cholesterol, high protein, you know, really being innovative in addressing these issues. And then some of it is supply and demand. And the more it's a niche market, the more it's going to cost to, to create each unit. So I think that, um, you know, there's, there's sort of a number of answers to that. But again, I think that, that um, Americans and just our, our whole um, humanity really have proven time and again that we can be creative in solving a lot of problems. I think Google is a great example of doing things that people once thought were unheard of. Um, this is an issue where I think if we put the time and attention and resources, it can be solved rather quickly. Um, and I think we're starting to see, in some ways, capitalism and these uh, inventive companies starting to jump in and, and address it as well. So we have a multi-prong approach. Again, these are sort of complicated, deeply rooted issues. So to say that there is a one-size-fits-all all answer that's going to address this in any sort of timely manner, I think is probably oversimplifying it a bit. So that's why we have the four areas that we work in, education being a large component of that. 
getting people to see what's really going on and encouraging them to reduce or ideally eliminating their meat, dairy, egg consumption. That's really the root cause of all of this, obviously. But we understand that the world is not going to go vegetarian or vegan, certainly not overnight. Um, and we think that these animals that are here right now uh, suffering as individuals with needs and interests deserve to be treated with as much care as, as we can give them. That being said, um, changes happen sort of slowly over time. So we view banning some of the worst factory farm practices, like these battery cages for egg laying hens where they can't spread their wings, or gestation crates for sows where they can't turn around, or tail docking, cutting the tails off these animals without painkillers, as being really unethical practices that we should be moving to end right now, and that we can start to reduce the amount of suffering that these animals are subjected to. Because these are real animals, real lives, the stakes are real for them. And though giving them a few more inches of space might not solve all the problems, and we certainly don't think that that is the case, we do think that it reduces the sum total of suffering that they're subjected to as we move towards a reduction in animal products and, and hopefully you know, more people starting to eliminate these products. So multi-prong approach, and within that, we have legislative initiatives, we have corporate outreach initiatives, um, looking at different power holders and stakeholders in this and how we can affect change within that. It's a great question. Um, a lot of the success that we've seen, like Proposition 2, which I mentioned before, are citizen-driven ballot initiatives. Uh, a lot of the states where there, there is a large farming community, um, the legislature is not voluntarily going to push through any sort of restrictive measure that would challenge such a big industry there. So they require ballot initiatives to come in because, again, consumers are really on the side of change even when big business isn't. But the problem is, is that you know, only about half the states in this country allow ballot initiatives. And some of the states like uh, Iowa that has the largest egg production and the largest pork production in this country do not have ballot initiative processes. And their legislature is very much controlled by big ag. So the, the pathway to affect legislative change there becomes very challenging. There is a federal uh, bill right now. It's a, regarding egg laying hens. It's not a perfect bill by any means, but it would set the first federal standards for animals on factory farms. Um, it would increase the amount of space that hens have in these cages. That is really the first federal bill that has found its way um, to Congress for farm animals in over 30 years. So it's and and the and the the pork and the beef industries are fighting desperately against that bill because they don't want to see any sort of precedent set on it. So it, it's challenging, as we know, legislation can be. There are a number of states right now, I think New Jersey is one of them, that are considering a gestation crate ban in their legislature. So um, that's the main one that comes to mind. I don't think, unfortunately, that Texas has anything currently that's pending for farm animals. Um, so that's sort of the situation with legislation right now. <laughs> yeah, it's a, good, it's a good question. We're not against food production. <laughs> Everyone has to eat. Um, and you know, there are such things as tofu factories that create jobs. There are things as soy milk factories that create jobs. Um, you know, carrot factories that create jobs. So this isn't, a, this isn't getting rid of a bunch of jobs. It's a shift in the economy and where those jobs go. So, exactly. That's exactly right. You know, by, by one industry shrinking or doing away, a lot of times other industries take their place that are more environmentally sound, are more progressive, are more ethical. So that's really what we're looking at. So we're just looking at a, a shift in a humane economy. Yeah, I, I think we do the best that we can. Uh, this isn't a competition or a purity test. So if we can eliminate meat, great. If we can reduce it on Mondays, Tuesdays, and or Wednesdays, great. Um, because we don't want anyone to feel overwhelmed. We don't want people to feel like either I'm part of the vegan team or I'm part of the I'm going to eat factory farm products every meal and not care about the issue team because that doesn't solve anything either. So I think that's really the take home message. Do the best that you can. 
Yeah, well, our, our Texas office is in Dallas, so we do a lot of work in Dallas. Um, but there are organizations here that are doing events, meetups, all sorts of things. I think Compassion Over Killing has a coordinator here. Um, last year, there was a, an Austin Vegetarian Festival. I'm not sure if it's happening again this year, but Google it. <laughs> yeah, there's certainly, there's certainly stuff going on. Um, and Mercy for Animals hopefully will be doing a lot more grassroots work in Austin in the very near future. Thank you so much for your time. Really appreciate it, guys.